there anyone here who had not heard that story before? Many, many times. I preach on it every year. It's one of the foundational pieces of scripture for me, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, partly because I love Luke's gospel. Luke is my favorite of the gospel writers because he was a physician. He was a man of uh, words. He was a man of detail. So the stories he tells are beautifully fleshed out for us to hear. He's the one who tells us the story about Jesus being born. He's the one who gives us great insight into who God is, no more than in this passage. This is part of the 15th chapter of Luke, and if you did the Disciple Bible study, did anybody here do that back in the day when it was around? Uh, the Disciple Bible study took you through 80% of Scripture in 32 weeks with the same group every day. Leander Keck, who was a seminary professor, called it God's lost and found department, the 15th chapter, because there are stories that lead up to this. This is the big one. But before that, there's a story of someone who had 99 sheep left in the field so he could go find the one that was lost. There was a woman who had coins, and she lost one, and she lit a lantern during the day and swept her house to find it. And you have to understand, you have to get what Scripture meant to them then to get what it means to us now. That's from a book called Teaching the Bible to Youth and Adults. We can't understand the nuances of Scripture without looking at these things in some detail. He didn't understand that turning on a light is not like flipping a switch in the first century. It's using precious resources to find something. That's how, that's how important it was to her to find this coin that was lost. Even though she had nine others, she had to find the one that was lost because it meant so much to her and to her family that she was willing to risk something to have it. Both those stories have something in common. They talk about repentance. Because so the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. Then we get to this story, the culmination, the father and the two sons. No mention of repentance in this one, though, is there? Well, I was an English major, which is why I like Luke so much and also why I like poetry so much. Robert Frost, I'm sure you've heard of Robert Frost. He was one of the first poet laureates that we had in the U.S., and he wrote a poem called The Death of the Hired Hand. I'm not going to read it to you. It's a long poem, but it's a conversation between a husband and wife. The husband comes home from work. His wife is sitting there and breaks the news to him that one of their hired hands who had been there from time to time throughout the years has come back. The husband is not impressed because this was not someone who was a good worker, someone who had gotten to be old at this point, someone who showed up when the work was about done and left when the, the harvest started. So... She explains to him why this time he's come home. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he's nothing to us anymore. Then was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Listen to those two lines again at the end. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. How many of you agree with that? Some of you do. Or then there's Team Wolf. We got Team Frost. Let's hear Team Wolf. Thomas Wolf, whose best known writing was called You Can't Go Home Again. How many of you are on Team Wolf? People say to me all the time, it must be so good to be home in Cockeysville. This is not the cocky cell I left in 1983, I'll tell you that right now. This isn't the church where I worshipped when I was a child. I've been here for services along the years, but I was in that little stone church over on Cocky Hill Road that is now for lease again. I keep thinking, I wish I had the money to lease it and do something really good for Jesus Christ in that little building too. But home is an interesting concept, isn't it? Especially in the story that we just read. Now, Home is a concept that got me in trouble when I was in West Virginia because I did services at the Board of Child Care, the Brown Road facility, for free for about two years. I went every Sunday evening, did a worship service for them. Kids came out, and more kids came all the time because it was not like a regular church service. It was very unstructured. We played games. We did all sorts of things, but we did worship, just not worship that looked traditional in any sense of the word. Well, the staff didn't like coming with the kids because the weekend staff was sort of there half-heartedly at best. And they complained. They said, they only come because you let the boys and the girls sit together. I said, well, duh. That's youth ministry. Let me let you on a secret. Youth ministry, they come to mate. You slip Jesus in when they're not looking, but they are there to mate. Am I right, Mark? Am I right or am I right? 
He's shaking his head like, don't make me go there, Terry. But every week at the end of the service, I'd say, what do you want to pray for this week? These were kids who had been removed from their homes because the homes were either too dangerous for the kids or the kids were too dangerous to be at home or in school. The Brown Road campus of the United Methodist Board of Child Care, the Baltimore-Washington Conference, that campus had its own officially licensed West Virginia State School with licensed teachers because these were kids who could not be at home anymore. And guess what they wanted to pray for every single week? The first prayer request. I want to go home. I want to be home. Home for some of them was so hellish you cannot imagine. I'm not even allowed to tell you what some of these kids went through without betraying the confidence of this place. But they wanted to be there. Which leads me not to home is the place where when you have to go there they have to take you in or you can't go home again. My go-to phrase is, be it ever so dysfunctional, there's no place like home. Now, I would not tell children they couldn't pray for that. What I would pray for th with them was, Lord, we want to be at home. We want to go home. Help us to understand that home is not always the best place for us to be. Give us grace until our homes are healthy and safe that we may return to them. That's how I prayed with them. And this is a story all about home, isn't it? The story we call the prodigal son, a word that does not appear anywhere in the scripture. Prodigal means reckless or wasteful. And certainly the prodigal himself, as we call him, the younger son, is reckless and wasteful. Because what does he say to his father at the beginning of the story? I want what is coming to me, which is the same as saying what to his father? You know, I wish you were dead. I want what's coming to me. How many of you think the father was foolish to give it to him? He lets him have it. Then where does he go? He goes to a distant land. You have to understand what it meant to them then to know what it means to us now. A distant land for a Jew is outside of the Holy Land, away from the temple, away from your practices, away from your faith. And he packs up everything, which implies what? He has no intention of ever coming back. I have stuff that I left in my mother's house in 1975 that is still in my mother's house. She'll say to me every now and then, you want me to bring this over when I come? And I say, no, nah, it's fine where it is, Mom. You all know what that's like, right? So he packs up and he leaves, and he wastes his money in dissolute living. We don't know what dissolute living is. You all have your own idea, right? Picture it. I know what you're picturing. You're picturing the stuff that you did when you were young, right? And then a famine comes. I don't know. We have some folks here who live through the Depression. You may have known what hunger really is like, but famine is ongoing hunger. I never like to waste food. I never do. And especially with the people in Ukraine suffering so greatly from a lack of food now. I eat stuff that's real scary looking just so I don't throw it away. But famine meant ongoing hunger. And he sells himself out to find some work to do when he's lost all his money through his dissolute living. And where does he work? What kind of farm? A pig farm. What is the problem with that? He's Jewish. Not only are you not allowed to eat bacon, you can't even touch bacon when it's still walking around on four feet. And nothing in all creation smells like a pig farm. If you've ever been near a pig farm, you know that scent, and there's nothing like it. There's nothing you can mistake for it. It smells like a pig farm and nothing else. Pigs not being the most hygienic of animals, and they have a fragrance all their own. And then he comes to himself. Let's all do it together. That way I could have had a V8 moment. He comes to himself, and he says, you know, my father's slaves eat better than this. They have bread and bread to spare, which goes back to the father being such a generous man. He didn't feed them just what he had to to keep them alive till they could work the next day. They had leftovers, slaves with leftovers. So he says then, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Let me be a slave to you. And he goes home. And as he goes home, with his tail between his legs, smelling like a pig, 
which makes him not just physically unclean, but ritually unclean. His father sees him, and what happened? His father was filled with what? We just read this, you know, a couple minutes ago. Father was filled with compassion, and what does he do? Look at the title of the sermon, boys and girls. He ran. He ran. He ran. You need to understand the first century men did not run. Why didn't they run? They were wearing dresses. In the Old Testament, in the law, if a priest serving in the temple to make sacrifice walked up the steps and showed an ankle, he had to be cleansed ritually. The father doesn't care about his dignity. He doesn't care that he's a wealthy landowner. He doesn't care that here comes this lousy son who done him wrong. He doesn't care. He runs to him with his arms open. He embraces him. He kisses him. He calls for slaves and says, get the best robe. Get my ring. And kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a barbecue, boys and girls. We're going to have some fun. We're going to celebrate because my son was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. What a story. And there's Big Brother. He comes near the house. He hears music playing. He says, nobody invited me to the party. Hmm. He says to his father's servants, what is going on? Your brother's home. We're having a party. Because your dad got him back safe and sound. Is there a parent here who would not greet your child who had returned safe and sound? with your arms open wide. But the elder brother, he's righteous. He's self-righteous, but he's got some righteousness on his side, doesn't he? Because he has done nothing but what his father asked him to do his entire life. This is the story of a man who has followed the law, obeyed it with a glad and generous heart, apparently, until baby brother comes home. But the father goes to him, too, and says, Son, come in. And he says, I have done everything you've asked. And I didn't even get a goat, a lousy little goat to have a party with my friends. But this son of yours, he can't even say my brother anymore, this son of yours comes crawling home and we kill the fatted calf. The father says to him something that makes no sense economically. It makes no sense in terms of the will and the inheritance and the property. He says, all I have belongs to you. We have to rejoice because this son of mine, this brother of yours was dead and is alive. We've got to rejoice. Now, when I was at the Board of Child Care, after I stopped doing the weekly services, I would go in once a year to do the American Family Week service, which was held in November around Thanksgiving time because we got to the point where we had to be so careful because the state of West Virginia paid part of the bills there that we had to minimize the talk of God even to the point of Thanksgiving. So we had the National Family Day observance. And they did something that they don't do anymore. They let me take kids off campus. And they went to my congregation. They met with my youth. And together they wrote a play based on the prodigal son. Forgive me, some of you have heard me tell the story before, but this one gets me every time. We changed the story. It was written by a bunch of teenagers. It went from a father with a farm to the story of a man who owned a construction company and he had two boys and one went to Las Vegas and danced with showgirls. Because, you know, the brother, he knew what dissolute living really meant. You squandered his money with prostitutes, you lousy little thing. Never did it say what the dissolute living really was. That's where his mind went immediately. So we wrote the script. But before we wrote the script, I met with the social workers. I met with the director of the Board of Child Care. I met with everyone who worked with the kids. They said, we have to be very careful because most of these children do not know their father or if they know their father, it's a horrible memory for them. Because most of them have fathers who are not present in their lives or abusive. Some of them were sexually abused. Some of them were physically abused. All of them were emotionally abused by parents. And I said to the kids, I said, you know, we have a lot of kids here, don't we? Some of them don't have really good relationships with their fathers, so maybe we should make it a grandmother, which was the suggestion of the social worker. I will never forget what I heard in response. One of the kids looked at me and said, no, Miss Terry, we have to leave it the way it is. It'll be a surprise ending this way because no one would expect a father to act like that.
I used to with confirmation classes or people who didn't know the church or God or Jesus Christ. When do you meet people like that? There are people in the world now who have never been in a church, ever. They've never known of our scriptures or our sacred stories. They don't know. I used to start out when we talked about sin with Adam and Eve in the garden, which we started Lent with this year. We had Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, Adam and Eve being tempted in the garden, the place where they had everything they needed, the place of deprivation, stories that go well hand in hand for people who know the scriptures, who know who God is. But I would stand in front of a confirmation class to talk about Adam and Eve and realize that I'm standing there talking about two naked people and a talking snake. Very little intersect with your average middle schooler or someone who doesn't know anything about scripture or God. They look at you like you got 16 heads because God would come down in this garden and walk and the people were naked. They didn't care they were naked. Then the snake came along and everything changed. You say that to people, they think you're nuts. But if you start a story, there was a dad and he had two sons. One was a goody two-shoes who did everything right. The other was a total screw-up. When he hit the wall, he turns and he goes to home and he sees his father running toward him. I will say to people, that is who God in Jesus Christ is. That is who God in Jesus Christ is, the one running to us with his arms open to embrace us. No matter how filthy we are, no matter what we've done wrong, no matter the mistakes we've made, no matter how many times we have fallen short, God in Jesus Christ is running to us with open arms. I don't know what that does to you, but that gets me every time. And there are still people in the world who think, no father would ever act like that. What a surprise ending. He ran. God runs to us in Christ. So that's why when we read the passage from Hebrews, let us lay aside the sin that clings to us so desperately and run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for our sake endured the cross. When we run toward God, when we run toward the cross, we're not running toward our own death. We're not running to our own humiliation. We're running toward our redemption, our salvation. We're running home, home to God, whose arms are always open. I don't know about you, but there are times I've gone home with my tail between my legs, not to my parents, but to my Father in heaven, only to find grace sufficient to every need I possibly have. So today, we're going to celebrate. We've got no fatted calf. Sorry if you're hungry for lunch. What's the place up the road? The barbecue place? Some of you might hit that on the way home today after this sermon. We don't have a fatted calf, but we have the bread and the cup of salvation. Grape juice for us. But come to the feast knowing that you are welcome, knowing that everything that God has is yours already and will be yours for eternity. And then run to God. Run to God. And in God's name, run to the world to embrace others with the grace that has found and saved you. Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I've told you before, every time I serve communion, every time I celebrate communion, I think of the people in my own life who have left me. I also think of that greater cloud of witnesses, the people that I never met who are there. Some of them I met, Dr. Lawrence Hulse Stuckey of Wesley Theological Seminary, who put the sacrament of Holy Communion so deeply into my heart that every time I celebrated, I remember why I was called, what I was called to do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose book, The Cost of Discipleship, still is one of the foundational books in my life. It begins, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer ended up losing his life as a traitor to Germany as he was hanged by the Third Reich, even as the camps were being cleared, Germany was being liberated, because he stood against Hitler when most of the church went along because they were afraid for their own safety. Most pastors had to sign a declaration of acceptance of the policies toward Jews of Adolf Hitler. Mother Teresa is one of my great cloud of witnesses. I used to have these photographs over my desk. Not only Mother Teresa, but St. Francis. Didn't have his photograph, but I had a little St. Francis statue up there. It's still in my office looking over my shoulder today as I sit there at my desk. Martin Luther King Jr. Oscar Romero. A priest who had gone along to get along in Central America. And as he raised the cup 
chalice when he decided to speak out on behalf of the people. As he raised the chalice, he was shot to death. Then there's my grandmother and all those who've come before me. It's their faith that formed my own. It's their faith sharing that made me who I am. It's their faith sharing that helped me to recognize the call in my life when other people denied it. Since we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, let's run with perseverance the race before us. So lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and run. Run toward God. Don't run with your head down. Run looking up because you know what you're going to see. You're going to see God running toward you with a smile saying, Welcome home, my child. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Amen.